Hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you once again to the organizers for having me. I'm just, I'm just, I don't want to shoot. Um, so uh, my name is Anna. Uh, I am uh, I am Portuguese, uh, and I I did my masters uh, recently at the University of Coimbra uh, in Portugal. And um, I'm going to read because I. <laughs> I, there's just too much to talk about, and I, I'm afraid I'll be uh, standing here forever. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, the act of giving human form to materiality eases our understanding of the world around us. As human beings, anthropomorphizing things, animals, and plants happens for many reasons, but perhaps most of all, because the human form is the one we know best. Um, having this in mind, I wanted to know how the representation of the human body changed uh, throughout pre- and proto-history in the Iberian Peninsula, and how such representations could contribute to an archaeology of the body. These were the starting points uh, of my master's dissertation, uh, which centered around objects dating from the Neolithic to the Iron Age, so covering roughly five millennia, give or take, uh, and the huge territorial scale that is the Iberian Peninsula, so Portugal and Spain. In this, uh, in this presentation, I hope to share with you some of the most uh, interesting aspects of my research and illustrate how a long diachronic approach centered around the representation of the body and the objects in which it occurs favor and allow for other or new interpretative readings of past social change. So my research was heavily focused on applying the body world model and ontology uh, to the Iberian Peninsula. This practical ontology created by Dr. John Robb and Dr. Oliver Harris carries multiple perspectives on the body, including the totality of experiences, practices, and body representations in a particular time and space central to the way the world is understood. This means that uh, for every human being, the body worlds are the worlds in which we all inhabit uh, simultaneously, and these worlds are both specific and cultural diverse. So basically, uh, this concept uh, encapsulates the notion that regardless of the time period to understand the body, we need to understand its cultural, social, pol political, and material frame of reference. But on the other hand, this frame of reference is always complex, sometimes contradictory, and it also has to be understood as historical because bodies are themselves uh, historical agents. They embody and construct understandings of the world, even if unconsciously. I focused on uh, five um, big artifactual groups, the selection of which derived from the continuity of the representation in some cases, for example, in pottery decorations and in figurines, and in other cases with the scarcity in which the body is depicted in the raw materials characteristic of uh, some periods, namely in metal. Other categories focused on possibly evocations of the human body, such as possible feeding bottles and twin vessels. And I mainly used uh, objects with long diachronies, although I did not go into contemporary debates explored at length, at length by other authors, such as uh, late prehistoric cheese flakes and Iron Age uh, exogenous materials. In order to have certain perspectives build upon others, this analysis worked on multiple scales in the sense that there was a, a reduced focus when analyzing the objects and their context, even though the goal remained that of having the big picture, allowing, the, allowing for the identification of different patterns and processes. And I should, however, make a disclaimer because it was never my intention to make an exhaustive in inventory of all the known body representations on portable objects from these periods. <laughs> this is rather a new approach to these, uh, drawing from a few specific examples which have never been analyzed together previously to this. And also another disclaimer is that I use these uh, chronological terms, Neolithic, Alcalithic, Bronze Age, etc. Et um, but I don't go into detail uh, on you know the uh, the the complex uh, uh, how do you say this uh, the the debates uh, regarding their chronologies because you know th this is just a way of trying to uh, make things uh, make sense of things. So. Body representation in portable art is a discursive element, however unconscious, that integrates and expresses corporeal life. But just as the body world concept itself, the representation's meaning is not limited. It allows contradic contradictions, individual expression, and divergencies in the same time and space. What this means is that uh, any causation proposed for the differences in body representation is itself the result of many other historical, cultural, social, and political processes. 
And although I cannot further expand today on these, I do want to point out that their importance for the way the body could have been thought of and experienced in the past. The moments of cultural transition, a, a bigger or smaller revolution, so to speak, inflect upon the bodily representations in portable objects. In fact, they essentially match the transformation uh, phases in the artistical treatment of the body. Although the changes in body representations could result from multiple factors, many of which we don't yet understand and would certainly be different from case to case, they could derive from the way the perception of the body in these moments of transition was also experiencing change. So these, tra these transitions are clear in the focus of uh, in the focus the Neolithic body representations tend to give to whole body depictions, although without many details. For example, these usually have no representations of eyes, noses, or mouths. Dating from the early ne Neolithic period are these pottery uh, decorations from Cova de Lourdes in Alicante and from Cova de la Sarsa in Valencia, both in Spain. During this time, anthropomorphs in pottery. Uh, anthropomorphs in pottery decorations are not common in terms of quantity. In many cases, they were found in caves, as is the case of the ones I, I showed before. There is, clear, there is clearly a concern with the central part of the body, and despite being schematic, some have upper and lower limbs, even fingers and heads. The schematism and the lack of individualized body markers or parts could relate to a new human-animal relation associated to the processes of sedentarization, agriculture, and the domestication of animals. And that goes on to be uh, consolidated throughout the whole of the Neolithic period. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It is worth noting, hybrid uh, representations are not common during this period. And however, if uh, sedentarization was a slow process, so were the shifts uh, in the perception of the body and the human-animal dichotomy is, not obvi is obviously not the only way to see or experience the world. It is thus possible to trace back to the Neolithic characteristics which occur in all the following periods, thanks to uh, the transition in human embodiment from landscape and animals to the bounded body, bounded spaces and social networks and material things, as Dujan Borek and other authors pointed out in The Body in History. A great example of this is precisely this pottery object, known as Gava Venus, from the prehistoric Gava mines near Barcelona, Spain. Dating from the Middle Neolithic period, it was found in a negative, in a negative structure, and although it is very fragmented, it has many anthropomorphic elements, as you can see. It has been interpreted as a female pregnant idol. Its hands with uh, detailed fingers and possible rings rest on its belly. It has small incisions below the face and on the arms that have been interpreted as some sort of jewelry, which is very interesting if we keep in mind it was found on a site mined for various sites used in jewelry. One of the most striking things Gava Venus has is the way the eyes are represented by two big, uh, almost solar circles. A similar iconography appears in later objects such as the trunc truncated conclave figurines from the second half of the fourth millennium in the south of Iberia and mainly in settlement sites in the Portuguese region of Alentejo. They have brief individualizations of the face. The eyes and nose were achieved by pressing fingers onto clay with incised lines below them. Their anthropomorphism is ambiguous, but they could represent a clothed body, and it is mainly suggested because of their association with the Gava Venus, as well as with later and clearer representations where the same iconography is present. So during the Neolithic, there seems to be a transition from a schematic body to a slightly less schematic body, where the face, eyes, and nose are individualized, particularly in the final stages of the period, and in the southwest of Iberia. It is almost like the, continu the continuity of the sedentarization process and population growth led to a growing importance of the face and sight consolidated in the following millennium. And even if these features are still abstract, they show the growing relevance of the most expressive and communicative part of the body at a time when the funerary practices also seem to demand observation with the megalithic phenomenon. Thus, these figurines and even some anthropomorphic cheese plates seem to be the prelude of the representation style that would become highly disseminated throughout the Calcolithic, which in the Iberian Peninsula generally corresponds to the third millennium. BC. Uh, usually known as the ocular motive, it consists of two big eyes, uh, which I don't know if it's well, at least here you can see <laughs> this one. Um, 
have two big eyes, uh, sometimes framed with curved eyebrows and often accompanied with facial lines or incisions, which are traditionally interpreted as facial paintings or tattoos, but have also been interpreted as scars and more recently as masks. The third millennium is now a period of affirmation of cultural regional differences made clear through, through the artifactual variety particular to each region, whilst also showing comparable economic and social increments. Nevertheless, because of its vast uh, areas suitable for thriving agricultural practices, it is in the Southwest that we see the development uh, of, um, of what some researchers have called pre-state societies with fortified settlements and increased differentiation in funerary practices. It is also, it is also there, as you hopefully can see, um, that, um, uh, that uh, the, uh, sorry, where most anthropomorphic portable artifacts have been found. This iconography also appears throughout most areas of the Iberian Peninsula in different materials, from local pottery decorations and figurines to rock art. The fact it was highly disseminated and it would have been known in most of the territory now attributed to Portugal and Spain doesn't necessarily correlate to groups of people being unified and culturally uh, standardized. However, it does point to the southern Iberian calcolithic societies not only being open to external st stimuli, clear uh, in objects made in ivory, for example, but also to the internal and peninsular communication web, which far exceeded the southwest. In the second half of the third millennium, the anthropomorphism of the ocular motif is clearer than ever before, as it appears in a typology known as the naturalistic figurines found in various sites in, of south, southern Portugal and Spain, ranging from 10 to 20 centimeters high. They have, uh, they very clearly represent human bodies, human naked bodies. They were found whole and fragmented in funerary and settlement contexts, including in what is thought to be uh, a workshop. They are realistic yet standardized. They are standing with arms closed around their waists, sometimes holding an object that could be a baston. Their heads uh, have hair and faces with big eyes, noses, sometimes mouth, and always the incised lines on their faces. And sometimes, but not always, they have indicators of biological sex. So even if these are the most naturalistic and proportional representation, uh, this standardization of a posture is clearly tense and unnatural. Here is the incredible figurine from the complex of ditched uh, enclosures of Perdigões in Regengues de Montserrat, Portugal. Besides being made in ivory, uh, its unique funerary context points to the importance of fragmentation, unification, and the relationships between bodies and body representations. I don't know if you, I, I don't know if you can see here. Um, well, you can see here that it is missing part of its leg. Um, but when it was found, um, it had been repaired with a small human bone. Yeah, this is very, okay, I cannot go on because I shut up. <laughs> uh, with the beginning of the second millennium BC and the transition to the Bronze Age, the ocular face disappears, as do most of the political and social elements characteristic of the previous period. The body almost completely disappears from portable objects and its representation occurs mainly on statues made here, such as this one. Uh, territorial, which are territorial markers, uh, which include anthropomorphic representations as well as garments and objects such as weapons. The limited, uh, the, sorry, the limited data for Bronze Age settlements in Iberia points to the concern, whether conscious or not, for the evocation of the body in portable objects, for example, through the presence of the uh, uh, sorry, double vessels and, and feeding bottles. At the same time, uh, the funerary practices shift once again with more variability, but less monumentality. Uh, on the one hand, more individualistic and, and discreet, uh, and on the other hand, more destructive and transformative towards the body through the introduction of cremation. During this time, some bodies were individualized and differentiated through the use of metallic ornaments, namely gold. In the beginning of the Iron Age, probably, this Bronze Age um, necklace is reused and its lock uh, is uh, I don't know if you can see here, but it's basically the, that figure, but it's here are the the feet and the head of the uh, so uh, so basically um, they decorated with a schematic anthropomorph. Throughout the first millennium BC, the body is consistently represented in other elements in, of jewelry, 
speaking to the relation uh, between real bodies and representations. And at the same time, it returns to pottery decorations, albeit in very schematic and ambiguous forms. With new and renewed external contacts, uh, new technologies regarding metalwork emerge, but the lost, uh, the lost wax casting is now used for bronze um, ex photos figurines. So during the Iron Age, the body is represented whole and in intentionally fragmented, but to the taste of foreign trends, reflecting once again the social political landscapes of the communities to which it belonged. With this necessarily uh, brief overview, small revolutions and transitions emerge through the scope of a long diachrony and should be interpreted as processes of gradual change in the perception of the body, extended at different levels through time and space. This is why the transition periods mentioned here simultaneously translate and are translated by the body worlds in which they are part of. And a lot more could be said, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for example, regarding the inter their interpretative challenges. But I would just briefly like to point out that throughout these chronologies, it is striking. The anthropomorphism is not very clear in many cases, which allows for further development of ideas on ambiguity, perception, hybridism, and the human-animal relations. However, for the most part, these objects, uh, regardless of their chronology, have been linked by traditional archaeology and by some researchers to this day to female deities. In fact, even when the representations do not have any sexual indicators, there is a forced attempt to read sex and, by extension, gender in the past. Um, and I'd just like to point out that the lack of sexual indicators is often assumed as a methodological problem, but this premise takes out of the equation who did the representation in the past and focuses on who interprets in the present, even if unconsciously. We should consider instead what was selected and represented since it is very difficult to access its true symbolic meaning. What I'm trying to say is the problem with the ambiguity of representation, be it around sexual indicators or even their anthropomorphism, has to do with interpretation much more than with methodology. On the other hand, by using and adapting the body world methodology to these objects, it was possible to understand that a long diachronical scope of analysis centered around the represented body and on what of it was left out reflects how portable objects mirror the shifts in the perception of the body, particularly in transition and cultural transformation periods. If we consider that new technologies and ways of material manipulation lead to new comprehensions of the human body, then the technologies representative of the, the Iberian pre and proto history show the multiple ways the representation of the body has changed through and with time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.